as heard previously on The Uncertain Hour. When does it stop being peanut butter? 95% peanuts. None of those big brands of peanut butter would even be able to be called peanut butter. In this corner, Skippy. And in this corner, Jif. Crisco. Crisco base. And Jif says, okay, well, that doesn't work for us because we have to say, you know, cottonseed oil, rapeseed oil, horrifying. Can you imagine that these scoundrels are trying to pass this cold cream off as peanut butter. And in this corner, Ruth Desmond and the Federation of Homemakers. We would like the protection of the regulatory agency in our interests. And now we come to the final chapter in our peanut butter trilogy. Return of the peanut butter grandma Jedi. Welcome back to the Uncertain Hour, where the things we fight the most about are the things we know the least about. I'm your host, Chrissy Clark, senior correspondent for Marketplace's Wealth and Poverty Desk. And right now, one of the things our country is fighting a lot about is federal regulations. The fights aren't as flashy as some of the other issues in the news right now, despite that flashy montage you just heard. But behind the scenes... As we speak, federal regulations are the subject of intense debate in our country's highest corridors of power. Debate about how far regulations should reach into our life, about who has the influence to write them, and who gets written off. Federal regulations are what this season of our show is all about. And in the last few episodes, I've been telling you the strange and revealing birth story of a single regulation, one of the most ridiculed but also pivotal regulations in American history, a regulation about what percentage of peanuts ought to be in peanut butter. So, quick recap. Remember, when we left off last episode, it was 1965, more than six years since the Food and Drug Administration had discovered that a bunch of the big peanut butter brands were being made with fewer and fewer actual peanuts and more and more artificial additives. Skippy was using lots of hydrogenated peanut oil. Jif was using lots of hydrogenated cotton and rapeseed oil, a.k.a. Crisco. And in the aftermath of these discoveries, the FDA has been trying to come up with some ground rules about what peanut butter actually is and isn't, so that consumers know what they're getting. The first draft of the proposed regulation was tight, 95% peanuts. 95% peanuts! And consumers like Ruth Desmond and her Federation of Homemakers loved it. But under this regulation, none of the three biggest peanut butter brands... You like peanuts. <laughs> you like Skippy. Peanut butter, peanut butter is so great. There's a great big peanut paste in Jif. None of them would have qualified as peanut butter. After lots of industry lobbying from various companies, the FDA revised its proposed regulation and then revised it again and again and again sometimes favoring one brand, sometimes another. The peanut butter brands were duking it out, trying to control how the regulation got written so it would favor their brands over the others. And meanwhile, consumer advocate Ruth Desmond and her Federation of Homemakers had been kind of sidelined. With all the industry infighting, the FDA wasn't paying much attention to consumer voices at all. And then, because of this quirk in the details of the law overseeing the FDA— the agency says, hang on, there are so many objections to the peanut butter proposal, they needed to hold this thing known as a formal evidentiary hearing. And that's what we're going to hear about this episode, this surreal moment when peanut butter was actually put on trial. Because in the world of regulations, that's basically what a formal evidentiary hearing is. A uh, trial-like format. That's Angie Boyce, bioethics researcher at Johns Hopkins, who's studied these peanut butter hearings. And they worked like this. There was an FDA hearing examiner who acted like the judge. There were witnesses who had to get sworn in, take the stand, give testimony, and undergo cross and direct examination. There were lawyers, lots of lawyers. There were things submitted into evidence and extended fights over each piece of evidence. There were stenographers typing it all up to keep it on the record. And at the end of it, officials at the FDA would sort through this formal hearing record 
and make a decision about the definition of peanut butter. This elaborate trial-like process was written into law by lawmakers back in the 1930s for a very specific reason, as a way to put a check on FDA power. Because there's always been this tension over the role of federal regulators. The whole reason Congress created government agencies like the FDA was to bring in technical experts, scientists. Unlike politicians, these people were supposed to understand the details of, in the FDA's case, food science and food safety. And unlike politicians, the idea was these regulation officials wouldn't be worried about getting reelected. So they wouldn't let politics cloud their judgment. They'd make fact-based decisions. But there have always been people who are skeptical of regulators. People with a fear that you still hear a lot today from our president and members of Congress. A fear that government agencies tend to overstep their power, tend to overregulate. And that's what these trial-like formal evidentiary hearings were meant to guard against. They were meant to keep the FDA in line. And it was at one of these hearings where burgeoning consumer advocate Ruth Desmond and her Federation of Homemakers would finally meet the peanut butter industry face to face. What was her strategy with the peanut butter hearings? Here's Janet Swagger, Ruth's daughter. To win. <laughs> how, did, how, did she, how did she go about it? She had no strategy. She just took them on. And if your head was spinning last episode when I described those preliminary fights between Skippy and Jif over the proposed regulation... In this corner, we have Jif. And in this corner, we have Skippy. Well, the fights in this formal hearing took things to a whole new level. We're talking 12-dimensional boxing. And in this corner, we have Ruth Desmond and the Federation of Homemakers. And in this corner, we have a small peanut butter manufacturer. And in this corner, we have the FDA. It wasn't as simple as government regulators versus industry, or even consumers versus industry. It was industry versus industry, Skippy versus Jif, but also industry versus consumers, Ruth and the homemakers. And meanwhile, the FDA was just trying to get a handle on what all these different groups wanted and what the most current science was on the safety of hydrogenated oil and other additives in peanut butter. Me and my producers have read through many of the thousands of pages of transcripts of these hearings, so you don't have to. And what struck us about them wasn't so much the play-by-play. In some ways, that was just more of the same. Each side was fighting for what they'd already been fighting for before the hearing started. Procter & Gamble didn't want to have to list Crisco or rapeseed oil on GIF's label. Skippy and Peter Pan wanted the peanut butter threshold to come down to 87%. Ruth Desmond wanted it to be 90 or 95%. But what's so interesting and revealing about these hearings are the power dynamics and the tactics used by each side. Surprising tactics that are still used even now when consumers and industry are trying to shape a government regulation. So the hearings got going in the fall of 1965 in that FDA hearing room with the peanut-colored walls. And from the outset, it was clear Ruth Desmond and her Federation of Homemakers were the underdogs. In fact, things started to unravel for them even before the hearings officially began. The pre-hearings were an ordeal for your officers without any attorneys to advise them. That's Janet reading from a newsletter her mom wrote to the members of the Federation about the peanut butter hearings and about how lawyers for the big peanut butter manufacturers tried to kick her out during the pre-hearings. They argued the issues would be too complicated for homemakers to follow, at which point Ruth made her very first statement in the peanut butter hearings— We would object very strenuously to being kept out of the hearings, she said. Here's Janet reading more of her mom's words. We maintained that it would be a tragedy if the voice of the consumer was stilled. The Federation pointed out that its officers and members had been interested in this peanut butter standard since 1959 and felt it would be an injustice not to let its officers represent the informed membership And as for the idea that the hearings were too complicated for homemakers, well, Ruth said peanut butter, which is eaten by children, should not be 
made complicated. And Ruth and the homemakers got to stay. Despite the continuing protests of the industry's lawyers, FDA permitted Federation officers to participate actively in this hearing, even to cross-examine witnesses and object to certain questions and answers. That's mother. (laughs) Never give up. Never give up when they tell you no. You take a different street or keep pushing. But it was an uphill push from there. The scene in the hearing room was so lopsided, it was almost funny. Here's Janet reading from her mom's newsletter again. The attorney representing Jif sometimes had two law clerks, dancing attendants, and a personal secretary, along with a statistician and experts to advise him on scientific matters. Skippy also had an entourage of attorneys. Sometimes there were as many as 30 attorneys present. Picture it. 30 lawyers representing various peanut butter companies. All of that against three, usually three little ladies. Ruth and two board members from the Federation of Homemakers. Just like her grandmotherly with their corsets and hose and gloves and hats and purses. And they'd sit, usually be the three of them would sit at the table together. And uh, the others would sit quietly. They didn't talk. Mother did all the talking. But they would sit there and agree with everything and, and look very elegant and grandmotherly. And when the industry lawyers said something particularly enraging to the homemakers, the ladies would give them a look. We used to call it the hairy eyeball <laughs> to them at, at, at proper intervals. Yes. So they could see the whites of their eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, they say they aren't as innocent as they seem. Look. The industry and the FDA lawyers weren't quite sure what to do with Ruth and the grandmothers and the eyeballs. Angie Boyce of Johns Hopkins says the food industry had never had to interact with a consumer quite so intimately before. This was one of the first times that a sort of ordinary consumer, sort of a grassroots layperson, had entered these debates. And yeah, describe that dynamic a little bit, because this is, so like, here's a kind of a random person from the public who is, like, doing cross-examinations of of peanut butter executives? Yep. Very well, too. Ruth's daughter, Janet, again. These, you know, impeccably suited gentlemen, you know, with their nose stuck up in the air, looking down at this little grandmotherly housewife, cross-examining them. The feeling in the room had to be intimidating to the average consumer. But Ruth was bold wrapped in her lobbying mink. She used her soundbite about peanut-flavored cold cream. She had another line she aimed at the food industry executives about what she saw as a basic unfairness in their industry. She said, here you all are feeding yourselves the best of food and making the American people eat sawdust. While Ruth was skeptical of the food industry in general during the hearings, these hearings also reveal just how much infighting there was, and still is, within the food industry. Reading through the transcripts, you see how some peanut butter companies didn't want to regulate the definition of peanut butter at all, said it would stifle innovation. But then other companies wanted a standard to give some order to the industry, create some ground rules. It's just that when it came to the specifics of those rules, they couldn't agree. All of the companies were really competing to get the standard to reflect their particular formulation. Skippy wanted the line to be at 87% peanuts, which is how many peanuts they had in their jars. Jif didn't want to have to list the kind of hydrogenated oil on their label, and on and on. Part of what surprised me as I learned about this battle, it totally blew apart one of the main stereotypes we have about government regulations, that they're this fight this power struggle primarily between two main forces, business versus government bureaucracy. They're often painted as these two monoliths. Government bureaucracy wants to regulate. Businesses are trying to avoid being regulated. But that's so not how it worked with peanut butter, or with most regulations, for that matter. The peanut butter companies weren't collectively fighting against government regulation. 
I talked to Kevin Myers, Senior Vice President for Research and Development at Hormel Foods, which since 2013 has owned Skippy. The peanut butter hearings were long before his time, but he says he's not surprised that each peanut butter company was trying to shape the regulation to use it as a tool that would give their own brand a competitive edge. Yeah, I'm sure each one of those companies was, was trying to keep what they saw as a foothold to the business and maintain their customer base and see what they could do to increase that base with whatever regulation was put in place. I mean, it makes sense. It's totally reasonable. They wouldn't want to um, change uh, their particular product. That's Angie Boyce again from Johns Hopkins. So they were trying to shape the standard. I think we should put this in the standard, wink, wink. And this is Suzanne Junod, a historian at the FDA. Because remember, for these companies, this was not a trivial matter, either in principle, in terms of making them change their formulas, or in, you know, actual market shares. Certainly, at every step, there were very competent, very good lawyers who were inclined to debate how many angels could dance on the head of a pen in order to protect their client's interest. And that's another thing this peanut butter quasi-trial reveals when you go through the transcripts. What lengths the industry lawyers would go to to protect their interests, to keep the upper hand. You see this most strikingly when the industry lawyers team up against Ruth Desmond. Even though they failed to kick her out of the hearings altogether, they did what they could to keep Ruth and the consumers she represented out of the debate. At one point, they tried to accuse the Federation of Homemakers of tax evasion, but Ruth had the documents to prove she'd been filing correctly. At another point, the industry lawyers started questioning all those letters consumers had written in to the FDA. Here's Angie Boyce again. Uh, An entire day was dedicated to basically arguing against admitting uh, the consumer comments, or rather, FDA analysis of those comments as evidence. And I guess you could you could see from the food industry's perspective, they're like, well, listen, if this was just one one lady kind of whipping up her friends and constituents and they're doing this massive campaign, how do we know if that's really representative of the of the average American consumer or not? But at the same time, the agency is supposed to listen to them and take those into account when they revise their regulations. And so it just it strikes me as so sort of morally wrong to dismiss those uh, comments out of hand. And then there was the whole issue of gender lurking in the hearing room. Remember, this was in the 1960s. Ruth Desmond was a woman, a homemaker in a room full of men. There was this one time when Ruth was cross-examining the owner of a peanut butter company. They really start to spar over the issue of whether consumers read labels. And whether the information on the back of a peanut jar is even useful. The industry guy says consumers don't want to have a bunch of information on the labels. It just confuses them. He says, it's difficult to get people to read. That's why we use callers so much, because they can tell callers right off the bat. She says... You assume then that the consumer is not very smart? He says, no, the consumer is no moron. She is your wife. At which point, Ruth says, to assume that consumers don't read labels is demeaning to their intelligence. And then she adds, and I am not your wife. You can almost see the hairy eyeballs the peanut butter guy would have gotten after that. The hearings took place over five months, from October 1965 to March 1966. And throughout the hearings, there were these gender dynamics. You have a woman, a grandmother, who is uh, pursuing this uh, fairly aggressive line of questioning with male experts. This kind of um, gender David and Goliath debate. Well, of course, in that time, women, we were all supposed to be like Donna Reed with our dresses and aprons on. Ruth's daughter, Janet, again. Women were not supposed to have any knowledge of of things like that, of, of things that only men, you know, when they went for their cigars and brandy, would talk about. And, and she did. Ruth wasn't afraid to point out very directly the old boys club she saw in the food industry. And as a product of that, what she saw as financial conflicts of interest. 
In the hearings, she brought up the financial relationships she'd observed between the peanut butter companies and some of the scientists that were testifying about the safety of peanut butter additives. She pointed out which scientists had a history of writing for industry-funded publications. All this is stuff that, in Ruth's day, had not been done before, according to Angie Boyce. To publicly charge experts with financial conflicts of interest, this was absolutely unheard of. And yet you see Desmond here really trying to pull together these uh, dense organizational and financial connections between industry, between government, between scientists. It's become a strategy that lots of consumer groups have adopted in years since. But Ruth Desmond was one of its pioneers. Ruth spent months cross-examining industry and FDA experts. And then, finally, she took the stand to give her own testimony in the hearings. She'd been collecting exhibits to enter into evidence that she'd picked up at the store. Peanut butter samples and labels. That's where those peanut butter jars I found in the archives come from. And what she said in her testimony walked this very careful line. When it came to the science about peanut butter additives, hydrogenated oil and all the rest, Ruth didn't pretend to be an expert. She didn't claim that the chemicals in peanut butter were necessarily dangerous. She just said, let's be careful with them. Pointed out that no one had studied what the long-term risks of eating a lot of them might be. Argued, let's not make American consumers the guinea pigs. She talked about the need for using caution instead of regrettable hindsight. Here's Janet reading her mom's words from the hearing transcript. I say, when you have a wonderfully wholesome product like peanut butter, which is going to be primarily consumed by children and by elderly people, let's keep it free from these things. It is not necessary at all to use these additives. And then she went on. I feel that the American housewife certainly is intelligent and that she tries to shop for the best values. But I do feel that she is woefully uninformed. And I would say that the public relations departments for the food industry haven't aided her education one whit. The bottom line for Ruth in all this was to not let the standard for peanut butter go below 90% peanuts. If companies wanted to sell other products with fewer peanuts and more additives, she said, fine, just don't let them call it peanut butter. Ruth got famous for a moment during these hearings. Remember, she earned that nickname, the peanut butter grandma who spit in the corporate eye. Lots of articles were written about her and the Federation of Homemakers. Just read the headlines of some of these. Yes, the peanut butter grandmother. She was America's most gutsy housewife, a woman who turned domestic concerns into national battles. But even though Ruth got famous because of the peanut butter hearings, by the end of them, there was still one big question. Would any of her arguments actually make a difference in the peanut butter standard or in our lives today? That's what we find out after the break. One of my favorite reporters, Sarah Cliff, has a new podcast out from Vox. It's called The Impact, and it's all about what happens to laws and policies out in the real world, how the decisions made by people in power affect our lives. The first season focuses on healthcare and the challenges so many of us face in the American healthcare system. There's this great story about a $629 charge for a single Band-Aid. There's one about why in the world in 2017 the fax machine is still such a big part of American medicine. And there are more serious stories, like one about deadly infections and the hospital policies that can actually prevent them. This podcast will change the way you think about healthcare. If you love The Uncertain Hour, I know you'll love The Impact. Listen and subscribe on your favorite podcast app and tell them we sent you. Okay, so back to our story. By the end of the peanut butter hearings, the FDA had a hearing transcript more than 7,000 pages long. When you add in all the reports and exhibits and jars of peanut butter that were entered into evidence, it was more than 100,000 pages. This is what President Jimmy Carter would later make fun of. It should not have taken 12 years and a hearing record of 100,000 pages for the FDA to decide what percentage of peanuts there ought to be in peanut butter. 
But Angie Boyce, the researcher from Johns Hopkins, has a different perspective. No disrespect to uh, President Carter, big fan of um, post, post-presidential work, but um, it's just a very simplistic way of framing issues. And she says the hearings aren't exactly a story about government overreach. But this really deep story, raising deep moral questions about, you know, who has the right to have a say in what's in our food and how do they have the right to say that? And how really do you balance um, opposing views, industry and consumer views in a fair way? In a way that protects consumer rights, but that's not overly restricting to industry innovation and the economy. Yeah, when you frame it as, you know, the percentage of peanuts and peanut butter, sure, 100,000 pages sounds ridiculous. But when you um, talk about the balancing of rights in our democracy, I mean, that to me sounds like a, a much deeper issue and one that was at stake here. As for the practical issues at stake, like who is and isn't peanut butter after all this and what all this has to do with today— Let's get into it. So after those five months of putting peanut butter on trial and the many years of debates that led up to that trial, in 1967, officials at the FDA sorted through the hearing transcripts, the food industry reports and customer surveys and consumer letters and food science studies, considered it all, and finally came to a decision about peanut butter. And I know you're dying to know who won this slugfest, this 12-dimensional boxing match between the FDA and Jif and Skippy and consumers like Ruth Desmond. And the crown goes to... And when all was said and done, I have to say, there really was no single clear winner, which is perhaps as it should be when it comes to government regulation. Ideally, it's all about compromise, right? So I'll break it down. Jif, the Crisco disruptor, won some stuff. The brand did finally convince the FDA that they shouldn't have to tell customers the specific type of hydrogenated oils they were using, meaning GIF marketers could stop worrying about having to put uncomfortable words like rapeseed on the label. GIF is still standing. Don't worry about the labels. Though today, the word rapeseed has lost some of its stigma, and GIF does put it on their label. So that's GIF. As for the FDA... They won some stuff in this fight, too. FDA, you did all right. The FDA succeeded in getting Jif to lay off using quite so much Crisco. Got Jif to go from their original 75% peanuts all the way up to 90%. And then there's Ruth Desmond. Ruth also won. Congratulations, Ruth. She convinced the FDA that the peanut butter standard shouldn't go lower than 90% peanuts, even though Skippy and Peter Pan had argued hard for 87%. The FDA held fast at 90. 90% peanuts. Congratulations, Ruth. You kept peanut butter from being chock full of additives and put up a great fight. And a weird side effect of all this is that, according to the FDA's final peanut butter rule... The final rule! Somehow, Jif was peanut butter, but Skippy and Peter Pan were not. That is, the industry leaders, two of the nation's oldest peanut butter brands, were no longer technically peanut butter because they only had 87% peanuts. So no matter how you look at it, in this epic peanut butter fight, Skippy and Peter Pan, they lost. Sorry, Skippy. Sorry, Peter Pan. I asked Kevin Myers, that executive at Hormel, the company who currently owns Skippy, about all this. I'm just trying to imagine, like, if, you, if you'd been working there at that point, what would have been going through your mind? <laughs> Kevin said he would have probably taken it in stride. Skippy probably already had a plan B. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure in the back room there were several scientists that were working to understand how they could change their process in order to meet the new standard if, if need be. Wouldn't you also just be kind of pissed, though? <laughs> like If you're like, wait a minute, we're Skippy, and now you're saying we're not peanut butter anymore? Yeah, I think there would probably been uh, a bit of that, that at that time, Skippy was the overwhelming uh, highest selling brand, and to now not call that peanut butter would have 
been a bit of a slap in the face, I'm sure. You're, you're more diplomatic than me. <laughs> After the final peanut butter regulation came out, Skippy and Peter Pan sued the FDA over it. The case almost went all the way up to the Supreme Court, but the justices declined to hear it. And eventually, Skippy and Peter Pan upped their peanut content to 90%, so they could be considered peanut butter. But that regulatory blow the FDA dealt Skippy with the final peanut butter standard, it took its toll. Skippy lost its crown as the best-selling peanut butter. Today, that title goes to Jif. This whole peanut butter case has mostly been forgotten, but in so many ways, it's still very much with us today. That 90% peanut threshold, it still holds. In fact, if you go to the peanut butter aisle of a grocery store today, you'll see that some jars do not say peanut butter on the label. Instead, they're labeled peanut butter spread because they have less than 90% peanuts. Another way that the peanut butter hearings still resonate today, it turns out that Ruth Desmond's big point about using caution rather than regrettable hindsight when it came to the additives in peanut butter, it was more right than she could have known. In the last few years, Skippy and Jif have phased out partially hydrogenated oil because, as Kevin Myers of Skippy explained to me, Partially hydrogenated oil has some level of trans fat. Trans fats are, are implicated in artery, potential artery clogging. Artery clogging that's linked to heart disease. So switching away from that partially hydrogenated, eliminating the trans fat possibility in the product was very important. I asked Kevin if he thinks, in retrospect, maybe the higher standard that Ruth Desmond and the FDA had originally called for, the 95% peanuts, would have been better, so that the amount of partially hydrogenated oil and trans fats would have been limited in peanut butter long ago. Well, I think having a 2020 hindsight of what has happened over the years, that limiting those to at least a, a lower level probably would have been a good approach to have at that point in time, yes. Of course, Ruth Desmond's point was, let's not wait for 2020 hindsight. Let's err on the side of precaution to begin with. And finally, one other way the peanut butter hearing's legacy is still with us today, that formal evidentiary hearing that went on for months with the cross-examinations and the sworn evidence and all the lawyers, as contentious as it was, there was one thing everyone involved agreed on by the end. When it comes to making regulations, formal trial-like hearings are a bad idea, a waste of time. A waste of time for the FDA, according to FDA historian Suzanne Junod. We just learned that it probably wasn't in anyone's best interest for us to have such a long, protracted set of hearings for one product. A waste of time for the peanut butter industry, according to food and drug lawyer Duke Collier. We concluded that when you looked at the time, the money, the effort, the cost benefit of this exercise did not justify its having been done. And a waste of time for consumer advocates, according to bioethicist Angie Boyce. Adversarial formats are not really great for discussing um, scientific evidence and making um, evidence-based regulations. And after peanut butter, the FDA mostly moved away from the formal hearing process to make rules. It became this sort of never-again moment. They went to a more informal process, one that's widely used across the government now, where rules are proposed by an agency, anyone from the public can submit a written comment, and then the agency considers all those comments and makes a final draft. But that all might change again. Right now, there's a bill going through Congress called the Regulatory Accountability Act. It's sponsored by lawmakers who are skeptical of the regulation process, and it would bring back those formal evidentiary hearings. Make them, potentially, a required step for most government agencies anytime they try to write a major regulation. The bill is packaged as a way to reform the regulatory process. The RAA would make regulators more accountable by bringing the public into the process. To strip the bureaucracy of the power. It improves the rulemaking process. So that we ensure that agencies are using the best information possible. But as the bill's written now, it could bring in a whole new era of peanut butter-style hearings. <laughs> 
I'm really curious what Ruth would think about all the political fighting going on right now about federal regulations. But we can't know. Ruth died in 1988 of breast cancer. She was in her 80s. Janet says her mom was really proud of the work she did in her life. She just wanted, she was glad that she had made people aware. That's all she sa- always said. I'm an, I was an alerter. You know, that's, that's, that was her legacy. I'm sure she's got her notoriety up in heaven. <laughs> she may be in a lobbying group up there. <laughs> the, good, the good Lord may be have his hands full. <laughs> she, oh. And we did find this one tiny bit of tape from an interview in the 1970s. It's just a snippet, but I thought you'd like to hear Ruth's voice. There are all kinds of pressures brought upon uh, our uh, regulatory agencies and our government to go along with the captains of industry. That's it for this episode of The Uncertain Hour. Thank you so much for listening. I should mention we reached out to Jif and Peter Pan, those brands' current and former owners, including Procter & Gamble. They all declined to comment for this story. The Uncertain Hour is produced by me, Chrissy Clark, as well as Caitlin Esch, Maria Hollenhorst, Tommy Andres, Lyra Smith, and Tony Wagner. Jake Gorski and Daniel Ramirez are our engineers. Nancy Fargali is the senior editor. Sotara Nieves is the executive director of On Demand at Marketplace. Deborah Clark is the senior vice president and general manager. Let us know what you think of this show. Our Twitter account is at Uncertain Hour. And if you like what you hear, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps us continue the work we do. And thank you for sending us your pictures of peanut butter. Peanut butter toast, peanut butter labels. They're wonderful. Finally, part of our funding comes from listeners like you who believe the stories we tell and how we tell them are important. Thanks to everyone who donates to help make this kind of reporting possible. Visit uncertainhour.com if you'd like to know more. So it's a Saturday morning and I'm in a grocery store with my daughter. Can you say hi? Hi. And my husband. And we are going to buy some peanut butter. Look, have you ever noticed? So this is Skippy. Reduced fat Skippy. Peanut butter spread. It's not actually, doesn't say peanut butter because it only has 60% peanuts. Can you say peanut butter? Peanut butter. Peanut butter. <laughs> Pretty close.